All right, do me a favor. Go to, we're going to do a couple things here. I want to walk through some preferences. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, making groups and just the overall use of groups and how you're going to work with them. You guys should have dealt with groups before, but in terms of editing, uh, how groups will help you in the edit is going to be a big deal. Do me a favor. Go to the audio alias, please. So go to the audio alias under my name. So you should see a folder that says Vince Casas. Under that folder, it should say audio 240. While we're discussing this, I'm going to have you guys transfer a file. Uh, the file essentially, uh, the file is called uh, One Last Call Project. One Last Call Audio 240 Project. I need that whole folder copied over to your, uh, your personal hard drive. That way you can carry it with you. Uh, and that way you do not lose it. You can go and drag that folder over. So it's under my name, under Audio 240, and it's One Last Call Audio 240 Project. So we'll let that thing transfer in the meantime, while you're letting that transfer, let's go ahead and look at the session that you have up. And uh, let's talk about a couple things. Open up the Pro Tools Preference menu, please. So just go to Pro Tools Preferences. We do need to talk about a few things that will be helping you on the day to day. Uh, in terms of operational use. Now, um, In the basic display functions here, see where it says tool tips and it says function details. If you're while you're still learning what some of these tools are, what some of the, the menus are, this is good for you to have open. Um, but once you get into standard operation, this tends to get in your way, particularly when you're trying to open lists and stuff, uh, because the tool tips tend to be open still while you're trying to see. The menus that lie underneath so a lot of times in your standard workflow this may be better for you to have disengaged um, the other thing here is down at the bottom see where it says warning di warnings and dialogues uh, and it says reset don't show this again settings this is kind of an interesting thing you guys ever seen a dialogue warning that pops up and there's a checkbox at the bottom where you can check it and say don't ever show this to me again well Pro Tools Designers kind of understood that, you know what, they, that may apply for a specific warning for a specific period of time, but in the end, that may hurt you if that warning ever does come up and you're going, well, why is my system not working correctly? And you don't have the dialogue to go with the, the, the reasons why. So uh, this is kind of nice to have, uh, kind of take note of, which means you shouldn't be nervous to put, don't ever show me again, in the instance that you may need to change your mind, you can just go in and reset it. Does that make sense? Uh, one easy place that this happens a lot, it's somewhat redundant, is uh, in the, the menu system for deleting uh, audio tracks. So when you delete audio tracks out of the clip, the clip list, a lot of times, let's take you to the clip list real quick. A lot of times when you're deleting, uh, like if I said, hey, let's select unused. You guys should have learned how to do this so far, hopefully. Clearing the, clearing the clip list, select unused, and then I hit clear. Uh, a lot of times, for me, a lot of times I don't do move to trash, I do remove instead because um, I like to keep a lot of my original files from the tracking session because I, li I like to go back and use them at, uh, at times, particularly for sampling. But let's say you hit remove. Um, notice how this, there's a whole set of Q, uh, well of course that one only give me one. There's a whole set of Q questions. You can disengage those uh, as well as, let's see, I think in this one, Uh, oh, you know what? Here we go. Let's try it this way. If I'm going to go in and write some, create a plugin and write some automation to the plugin, I think you get a dialog in that particular instance as well, which is kind of you know one of those things where you you may for that particular session while you're removing stuff not care about whether or not that automation is bumped out. So I'm just gonna oh like we talked about on uh, Monday. Which would be good, DeQuandre, make sure you check this stuff out because uh, we talked about plugin automation a little bit. Uh, oh, this one doesn't even have the option for it. 
Basically, that's what this dialogue is referring to, warnings and dialogues. Now, show quick start dialogue when Pro Tools starts. Most people don't know that you can disengage that. You know when you open Pro Tools and you get this big square window that comes up and it says, hey, do you want to use a template? Do you want to create a new blank session? Right? You know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you guys notice that you could do the same thing from the file menu? The file menu, you can hit new session or you can hit new from template in, in the file menu. So if you wish to not have this be in your face, particularly if you're one of my students that learned a procedure that showed them how to open Pro Tools, first thing you do when you open Pro Tools was do what? Cancel, right? You could bypass the need to do the cancel process by simply disengaging the quick start menu here. It's kind of nice. Another major thing for you guys, and the reason I'm kind of having you, I'm going to walk through some grouping stuff because color coding. Color coding is beneficial. It's very helpful for you to maybe, maybe get a quick visual representation of what's happening on screen. Color coding is not everything. If you're really keeping track of your session, it's not the end of the world if you're not color coding because the, the problem with color coding is if you don't set Pro Tools to color code effectively for you and it's automatically doing it, um, you know, you have, then you have to manually go in and color code everything. And sometimes color coding just kind of becomes a mundane process in your life. You know, at the end of the day, if this isn't really expediting, if the goal is to expedite my process, my workflow, but if color coding, if the process of color coding takes more time than the time that you're saving by color coding, then it's a, a moot point. You, you kind of understand. So basically, my suggestion here is color coding. See where it says, always display marker colors. I like that one. If you guys have ever noticed, people have marker uh, markers on their session that are super colorful. That is how they engage that, that always display marker color. So let's say uh, from a color coding standpoint, I'm going to disengage it real quick, just show you some markers. So if I go to the timeline and I decide, you know, I'm going to make a marker here and I'm going to make a marker here. So you see my location one marker, my location two marker, right? Location three marker, right? Follow me there. So notice how they're just yellow markers without much going on with them. Always display marker colors. Hit OK. Notice that just changed. You see how that changed? Now all of a sudden the zones of my markers are in you know, particular colors. So you don't get that anywhere else but inside of that preference menu. So kind of a key element. But the color coding things that you get in the preference menu, these can be very beneficial for you in terms of your setup, so you don't have to go back and do these. I like doing it this way. See where it says default track color coding? I prefer the default track color coding to be in groups. Why? Because if it's in tracks and many channels, it means every individual channel gets a different color. If it's in uh, tracks and many devices, then it's based upon the input routing. Right, so I don't particularly like that either. If it's in track type, then it's only all of your audio will be red, all of your MIDI will be blue. Well, if you never did anything else but audio, maybe some auxes, you're gonna have a bunch of red and you'll have a couple blue auxes, and there's no real benefit to color coding because it's a two tone palette, basically. So, preference for this is groups for, for track color coding. Now, what's the difference between track and clip? Anybody know? What's the difference between a track and a clip? Track has the name. What's in the cool, okay, so the track is the actual channel you see in the mix window. That's the track. The clip is the, the, the actual piece of waveform in the edit window. So track color coding in groups, that's awesome. Default clip color coding, this one you can set kind of a couple different things. Now, you might like groups, you might like tracks and mini channels. Most people use this, one of these two. You could actually do it based upon marker locations as well. Uh, default clip color coding. You know, so tracks and mini channels, tracks and mini devices, groups, track color. Now, in the color coding itself, if you don't know what your groups are before you start tracking, um, it's okay because your groups, as you adhere to your groups in the, after the fact, so if you record a bunch of stuff and now you apply groups, your group colors get applied. The other thing you may notice in your tracks and MIDI channels, if they're color coded, this based upon just the track and the MIDI channel itself, as you move that track, let's say I move this track down, notice I, I just initiated a color change. You see that? 
So these could be beneficial for you. I like it either in the tracks and MIDI channels or the groups for that setting as well. Uh, marker locations, let me show you this one. So check this out. See how it changes as I move it inside of these locations? A uh, benefit to this is that, hey, you could actually, if you have specific things that fall inside of specific marker locations, like let's say you're doing a lot of loops that, that are like, hey, this is the verse, this is the chorus, and all that stuff comes in and goes out. This works really well because then you'd see everything that's part of verse one is going to be blue, and everything that's part of verse two or, or you know the chorus is going to be green, and then everything that's part of the third part is going to be purple. Uh, Downside to this, in most cases, you should have things that overlap these sections. What color does this stay? It's based upon where the, where the file essentially starts, where the audio starts. What's interesting is, even though the clip, look how long this clip is. Can you see how long this clip is? Notice where the first transient starts. As soon as that transient crosses the location, not the clip itself, but the transient, crosses the location, it actually changes colors. Make sense? Yeah. Um, okay, so there's your color coding options. Let's go to operation. So a couple of things in operation you need to know that are going to be very, very important for you. Um, all of this transport stuff actually, except for latch, forward, and rewind, exists up at the top of the, in this menu right here with the stuff we covered in the tools menu on uh, Monday. But this is where you find your auto backups. Anybody know how, how, anybody, oh, I should say this. Anybody had to ever use an auto backup? Technically, in reality, you may use an auto backup maybe once or twice a year. You should technically, if you're saving effectively, you'll never need an auto backup. Um, but I've seen instances where right in the process of, okay, you're tracking something. While you're tracking it, you're not saving until the tracking stops. You push stop. While it's tracking, the computer freezes. It forces a force shutdown. When the computer freezes, usually when you're running your, your CPU limit at 99%. I don't know if you've been taught not to do that. I don't know if you've been taught not to put your CPU usage limit at 99%. In the playback engine, your preferable CPU usage limit is about, is about 85%. Why? Because if you take up 99% of your computer's resources, it's only leaving 1% for the computer to do its normal functions, like screen redraws, like just operating like between uh, different applications. And heaven forbid you put it at 99% and you're running Reason and Postals together, you left 1% for Reason. You know, and it doesn't mean it runs at 99%. It just means when it peaks and it maximizes that peaks for the CPU usage, it jumps and spikes all the way up to 99%. Sometimes the computer will then force freeze in the middle of tracking situation and then when it freezes you get locked out what are you what are your options not much other than force quit and then when you force quit guess what you don't get to save so there therein lies the auto backups option now notice this says enable session file auto backup keep the 10 most recent backups there's the only problem with auto auto backups auto backups take up dsp cpu usage Especially when an auto backup that you set up for tapping every five minutes actually happens, it starts or gets triggered in the middle of you do, of doing a very heavy CPU usage process. So it, sometimes it can be a hindrance to have too many backups happening or firing at once. So a lot of times, it, you know, the five to ten minutes, you know, why is that beneficial? Because even if you set it to ten minutes, can you replicate what you did in the last ten minutes? And how long would it take you to replicate what happens what happened in the last ten minutes? probably 10 minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so you're kind of, whatever time you're really willing to lose is the amount of time that you put here. But it, you wouldn't, I'd never suggest you just putting this at 60 seconds and doing it every minute because it has a CPU draw every time it does it. All right, so it's very, it's kind of an important deal. When I was in the studio, more often than not, I would turn that off, you know? Because when I'm working on a computer that never crashes, it almost never has problems. I'm never going to need it. And actually, it'll just have more CPU draw than I need. So um, that's kind of one of those food for thoughts there. Uh, the user library. The, you can actually choose your root folder for um, your user library information. 
And the, in the user libraries, that's where you get your templates. All your templates get saved. Um, your plugin uh, settings also for the session. Each individual session will carry with the session. But if they're specific to the overall platform, they're going to go and be saved in this document. Now, the, here's the crappy part. Most people don't know where this is. So when you save your template and you want to copy it to someone, hey, hey, bud, I made a template. Here, you can use it. Most people don't know where to find it. And it's because they haven't actually identified where this user library section is. And this is interesting. It's under user, student, documents, and then it's under Pro Tools. That's kind of an odd place because all your other stuff is saved under applications in the applications folder or it's saved in your Pro Tools session. So here it adds a third location for information for Pro Tools. So pretty important to kind of keep an eye on. Now, let's talk about this because this is kind of interesting. In the record mode, oh shoot, hold on one sec. Javi. Sorry, guys. Okay, so in your record options, a couple things to think about. Anybody know what the word latch means? Yeah. What, what is it? Say it again? It stays. It stays. Okay. A lot of times in recording, latch typically means that, that uh, it, like in automation, if you leave it, it stays in the last location that you left off at and it runs to the end. But in terms of how latch is used in reference to buttons, latch means that if I hit record on one track and then I hit record on another, the previous one, just like Cameron said, stays. If it's in a non-latch position, it will force your system to only be able to record and enable one track at a time. Why would that be beneficial? That's beneficial. Think about this. It's kind of cool. That's beneficial if you're like me and you want to do loop recording. And while you're loop recording, you want to stack new tracks. I don't know if you guys have ever done that. Have you guys ever done that? This might be a cool thing to learn. Because it's really good when you're, when you're operating either with individual musicians or like yourself. Like every now and then I'll have a guy go in the studio and say, hey bud, let's loop record your guitar solo. Where he's going to play it 20 times and we'll go through and pick out the best one and we'll just do a loop section. Well, if you were to take that idea and jump that to a completely different idea, instead of doing it as a playlist, you wanted to actually create layers of tracks. I'll do this sometimes when it's just me. I'll just sing a chorus and I'll stack harmonies. Sing line one and jump to the next track, sing line two, jump to the next track, sing line three, add harmonies, add layers, and then before you know it, it only takes you, you know, a couple minutes to really add a stack. But with the latch engaged, if you click on one track to record while you're disengaging the other, it's a two-step process. Right? And it's not easy to do in the loop mode. If you disable that, it means that when you, anyone you click as a record will disengage the previous, which is nice, because it means that automatically with one click it's going to shut off the previous. I'll have to show you some of that, because that's kind of more of an advanced technique, but you know, you'd know you also have to get kind of used to doing it in that way. Uh, enable automation in record. Anybody use Reason? Reason? Reason users? Reason users? Okay. What I like about Reason, it's kind of nice, is Reason automatically records all automation while recording. Which means if you're performing, like if you're most, let's just say real keyboarder, keyboardists, keyboard performers, uh, they don't just play this. They play this, they use foot pedals, and they do a lot of stuff while they're playing. Like if you've ever actually seen someone that really plays, all that stuff that you edit and post, they do a lot. They're really good at doing well, the cool part about that is, is while they're doing that, all this control stuff that they're doing gets written as automation to the DAW, and they're synced together. 
By default, Reason is set to have both go live. By default, Pro Tools is set to have both go separately. So in order to actually generate automation while you're tracking, you have to have this button engaged. See this right here? Not hard. Not hard. You just have to find it. Uh, another major thing that we're going to use when you're loop recording, like I was saying, hey, if I have someone in the studio and I want to loop record them, and I'm just going to say, look, I'm going to give you this chorus section. Just keep singing it a couple times. We're going to do a bunch of versions. Like if you're trying to jam through the studio, a lot of times you're going to do loop recording. The drummers, drummers love loop recording. All right, bud, we did your whole. I just did your whole stuff into end. I love it, but I want to really get a different type of fill for this one transition. All you have to do is I'm going to set you up for a four bar, and at the end of every four bars, you do the fill, and it'll kick you back around again, and you just keep playing. So literally, they can just go. And all it's going to do is keep kicking around, kicking around, kicking around. So that you can go back and go, oh, I love this fill. I hate this fill. I'm going to extract this fill, copy paste it in another spot, all that stuff. But in order to keep those takes as the loop recording goes through, you have to have some engaged call. Automatically create new playlists when loop recording. Pretty cool, huh? That Seriously, this one button right here, this will be a big friend of yours, all right? So it's going to be a big key for what you're, you're going to do in the future. Uh, just jumping through a few other things in here that are going to be very important for your, your, uh, your process. In terms of uh, the, the editing, we talked about Zoom Toggle. You guys remember that Zoom Toggle? Let me go show, show it to you. Is this is Zoom Toggle. In the Preference menu, you can set your settings for Zoom Toggle in the Editing tab. See where it says Zoom Toggle? Vertical MIDI Zoom. So we talked about piano roll a little bit, but you could actually set your how your piano roll is going to be used in the Vertical MIDI Zoom, and then you have your Horizontal Zoom, Selection or Last Used. Uh, the Selection version was when I did this. You guys remember when I was doing this and I was saying, all right, if I select this section and I hit Zoom Toggle, it's going to jump to it. Right? Um, but, oops. If I want to use this other method, I could say, you know what, La last use. Some guys actually like to use this last use option, horizontal zoom, last use. What that means is the last thing that I have set up is the way that it's going to toggle. So, you know, if I go to... If I said, you know what, I need to see a real blown up version of what this is, when you toggle, it's going to jump back to the way that it was, and then it'll, it'll go back to what you had last set it up with in terms of size, which is kind of nice. You know, so there's one option. I like the selection one, though, because I think you, you have more opportunity to change on the fly what you're zooming towards. You know, so we've done a little bit of that. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Oh, you could do zoom toggle uh, follows edit selection as well. So if you wanted to zoom toggle only edit selection spaces, like this might actually be a great tool for you because you're used to, in most cases, making a selection. And when you push play, it follows that selection. If you then did that and zoom toggle, always toggle towards... Um, the selection that you have highlighted, then you'll always have the option of, all right, I want to blow this part up right here. Just select it, and there it goes. Actually, in, in, in fact, that would be my preferred use of the Zoom Toggle feature. Zoom Toggle follows edit selection. Check this out. So this is something that most people forget about. Levels of undo. The levels of undo actually were enhanced. It used to be that Pro Tools only offered 32 levels of undo. Do you know what that means? 30, 30, 30, yeah, 32 times. Now your max level is 64. Well, here's the catch with this. If you guys are ever going to complete an operation that you automatically know you may hate, absolutely hate, it, let's say it's uh, as simple as, all right, I'm going to copy paste some loop parts from this track, but I don't know if I'll like it. Because this is the big one that happens in this format. Just duplicate the playlist and save the original, right? Or do a save session, or do a save as for the session. Save as version two. I just was working on a project where they wanted the outro for the song moved to the intro for the song, and for it to start the way that it ends, right? Kind of 
on a big move because you have to go in and chop up the entire session. That one I just did a save as alternate version. Right? It's easier to do in that format. Because the problem is, is if, if you guys do a lot of copy pasting, it only takes 64 copy paste moves for you to be beyond, or 65 should I say, for you to be beyond the undo option. Does that make sense? Sounds like that's a lot, but in reality, that's not a lot if, if you're doing a lot of snapping the grid and you're copy pasting all these little parts in and you're locking these parts in one by one. When you guys do warp time, uh, we're going to talk about time alignment with warping. When you do warp time and you're going in there and you're manually moving warp time markers, once you move beyond the 65th, you're, you're out of luck. And by the time you get to the end of your time warp and you're like, oh, shoot, I accidentally deleted something before this and I couldn't figure out how, but I know I did it before I started this set of operations, you're out of luck. What do you do? You have to go back to your session backup. So not the only thing you really could do. But it's important to know that your level, you do have a maximum amount of fun dudes. Uh, 64 is your magic number. OK, so uh, what do we got? Uh, OK, in the last 20 minutes, we're going to talk. I want to, so remind me, I'm leaving off on the editing tab. So the next one we come to is going to be the mixing, mixing tab. Go ahead and uh, close this session. I want you to open the session that I had you guys import or uh, uh, copy over. It was called One Last Call Audio 240 Project. This particular session, I think it's like one point something gigs, has a multitude of, of tracks. And actually when you, when you open it up, it'll say there are more active audio tracks than you can even play back. Let me know when it's open. Um, don't jump into it just yet. I'm going to walk you through something with it real quick. What I want to do first uh, is there are there there's a large number of uh, string tracks at the very end. Half the reason that it's count the, the, the track count is so high. I think it's okay. Half the reason the track count is so high is because there's a large number of violins and violas all the way at the bottom. Um, and I, I personally track this myself, so I kind of know the ins and outs of what this looks like. But what we're going to do first is we're going to want to go through and group all these before we begin to make edits. So I have this session here because I kind of want you guys as a class to be able to do a couple things. We're going to be editing with this project, and then we're going to focus on what a mix down looks like with a project of this, this size and capacity. But we're going to need to go through it step by step and kind of talk about each of these elements and, and how they operate effectively inside of Pro Tools. First thing I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and start splitting these up into groups. But before we split them into groups, I want to talk to you about how groups work. You should know something about groups, but let's talk about the advanced elements of grouping and why we need to group. So what's a benefit from, why would I want to group right away? Anybody know? What's the benefit of grouping right away, right now? Yeah, okay, organization. What about you guys? Were you guys able to open the session up? Oh, was it alias on? No. Oh. Oh, there it is. Uh, just FYI, for you guys that have not been around long enough to maybe know this, the alias will not work if Wi-Fi is on. Yeah, because the alias is Ethernet. And if the, if the Wi-Fi is on, it always takes priority. So easy fix if your alias isn't working, just go and disengage Wi-Fi. Technically, you already have internet to the computer via Ethernet, <laughs> which is actually faster than the Wi-Fi. Yeah, I know. I was like, wait, Yeah, a lot of times students don't know what to do because that's like, they, they just default to Engaging Wi-Fi, I don't know why. I guess they're used to it. Uh, and it doesn't really show the Ethernet options up there. Okay, so back to the benefits. William says the benefit of grouping tracks is A number one organization. So here's the catch. Here's the, here's the catch in the overall. If I hand you, as an artist, if I hand you my project to either edit or mix, what you must do with my project is make sure that the timing that I give you stays intact unless we have a conversation about changing timing elements. 
So a big deal about that is you got a group of vocals. All those vocals need to be grouped together so that any edits that you make are made to the group as a whole and that those group vocals essentially don't end up being shifted or displaced at a time from one another. The other thing is, is we have a multitude of tracks for the drums. If you look at the drums, we have kick, we have a kick replacement, we have kick two, snare one, two, and three. There's just different mic options for the snare. Snare bottom, hi-hat, let's see, that ends up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, four, fourteen, yeah, fourteen tracks for the drums. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna start grouping them. So um, you can go ahead and get a jump start on grouping them, but just make sure, I'm gonna show you, talk to you about a little bit of grouping with them. 14 tracks for the drums. So here's the big deal with the drums, okay? That you may or may not have known. With drums, if we're doing multiple tracks at the same time, if we track multiple channels live at the same time, that means that bleeding from the kick drum exists in the overheads. Bleeding from the snare drum exists in the toms. If we were to shift any of these or edit any of these outside of the time reference with one another, it would create phasing, which essentially would make the, the tone or the sound go swishy. Get that word phasing. Um, so we have to make sure that the drums get locked. So a couple groups I would suggest. Highlight all drums, group all drums, make one drum group. We can make a drum group, we can make a bass group, we can make the... Uh, a guitar group, do we need to make a piano group? Say it again? Exactly. There's only one piano, so we don't need a piano group. But we will need a vocal group, we'll need a choir group, we'll need a string group. But let me talk to you about that. Hopefully by now you should know how to make groups. You're just going to click on the nameplate of the first thing you want to group. You're going to hold shift and you go all the way down to the last thing that you want to group. Right? And you hit command what? Command G to make your group. Here's the big deal with the groups that's going to be important for you guys. And a lot of people don't notice this until it's too late. All right, so just uh, eyes up just for like 10 seconds. Okay, for like 60, okay? Be honest. Okay, group name, no brainer. But the big thing is, is this group type must be edit and mix, and the items that are linked within the group must be all four of those. Because if you're going to automate any levels for the sends, the send mutes, or the solos, it's going to be easiest to have them all activated. So please activate all. And then you're just going to make sure that all the tracks that you're supposed to be grouping on are, are on the right. Let's say currently in group. And then you can just hit OK. Pretty simple, right? So make sure you title it. So this is my drum group. And there's your first group. Now, if you color coded this correctly, if in your preference you had color coding set to based upon groups, all these things should be color coding in your mix window in the blue. Right. One other thing to, to note while you're doing this group, if you want to see more visualization for your color coding as you're making groups, go to the window color palette. So on the window, if I go to color palette, all I have to do is engage this little rainbow trigger down here. You see the difference? Oh, not by much on screen. Let me oversaturate it. Yep, you could, and actually while you're here, you technically could. Uh, you'll notice that what shows here is where it says clips and tracks. If you, do, if you toggle this to groups, it'll show which group color is being applied at the moment. You could change it to any one of these colors. But again, you have to select this little rainbow marker or little rainbow button. Take the saturation all the way up if you want it to be brighter so that you could see it better amongst your groups. So, you know, that's fairly simple stuff. But you're just going to go through and group all these. So you'll have a drum group, you'll have a bass group, you'll have a guitar group. If you mess up on any of the groups, by chance, if you make a mistake with the groups, down in the bottom in the group section, it may be not open up if you if you don't have this little lane open up on the left side open this lane on the bottom left so you can see the groups section down here 
In the groups menu, you're just going to go to modify groups. Uh, a lot of times this happens because maybe you put the wrong track in the group. All you're going to do is select the track on the right and hit remove so it kicks it out. If you forgot to add a track, you're going to go on the left, a list on the left and just hit add and it'll sling it into the group. Um, and then see where it says at the bottom, it says use track selection from mix slash edit window. Uh, if you want to add anything to the group based upon just clicking on items down below, you can hit add or replace. Uh, but I was going to modify mine because I accidentally wrote the wrong name in. So group base. That was pretty simple, right? Let me know when you're done because I'm going to talk about some basic functions of session work in terms of edits. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Anything that has more than one track, let's go ahead and group them. It'll help us out tremendously. Now, when it comes to the vocals, I would separate the groups that say Vox 1 through 6 as a group and then make a new group for the BGVs and make a new group for the choir. A lot of singing going on in this one. You'll see why. Uh, you can just, if you click like a nameplate you want to unclick, uh, you can hold option and click it. Yeah, but it just unclicked the whole thing. Well, you have to reselect. Like, let's say, you, like, uh, how did you do it? Did you click one and then hold shift and click another? Like, were you clicking like a ring? Like, let's say, look look on screen. The only other thing you could do here is uh, if I accidentally overshot the choir and I accidentally grabbed BGV, if I hold shift and click, if, actually, you'll have to even redo it. You'll have to reset it, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it was left, if you did it on the right, like, say I overshot it on the right, you could just hold shift and undo it. So, but holding option deselects all, and then you could just start over again with the selection. When you get towards the end, you might want to separate the violins from the violas because, well, from a mix down standpoint, you are going to approach them differently. Why, why would that be? Anybody have a thought? Because uh, they both got D. Yeah, why would you mix them differently? Why? Because they both got class, right? Because they sound different. Yeah, because tonally they're in, a, they're in two different uh, octave ranges. The, the violin and the viola, they have two different sounds. Uh, and even if you wanted to break it down, when I, when I do my mix downs and I have two different guitarists, like they may be both playing, and I've had sessions where like, they come in and they play electric guitar and they both share the same amp, but they still have two different sounds. A lot of times I'll make, you know, guitar, I'll group, group guitar one, group guitar two or group guitar for you know this person and group guitar for that person because they, they have different unique sounds. These groups are going to help you edit when we start editing. These groups are going to be helpful for edit, but when you get to the mix down, these groups are also going to dictate how you create your aux buses. Everybody's done an aux bus before, correct? Yeah. Right? All of you have done some sort of aux bus for either reverb or bus mix downs. We're going to do both in this class because it's important that you understand how both work. Um, but again, grouping them is going to really help in that process as well. Now, notice there's something unique about this. Did you guys notice that all of the faders are set to negative infinity? Yeah. Yeah. 
I'll tell you the reason why. Because when you're actually working with a project that you've never heard, the worst thing you could do is just throw everything to Unity and push play. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, well, I want different groups. I want a group for the violin and a group for the viola. Okay. Yeah, you might have to click into the nameplate to see which one's which. Um, the reason you're not going to put them at Unity is just push play. There's a couple reasons. One reason is because, first of all, what we know about uh, um, uh, headroom, right? We lose how many dB per three, three dB per channel of audio. Well, if we calculated how many channels of audio we have here, and then we calculated how much dB we're losing, it's quite a bit of a loss in the overall dB range. Well, that's one reason. Here's the other reason. One of the reasons why digital audio sounds different than analog audio, one real basic principle that digital audio sounds different than analog audio is that people mix digital audio differently than they mix analog audio. In analog audio, you would never set a fader at Unity and just open it up and see what happens. What do you do with an analog console when you're bringing something up? Yeah, you, have the, you turn it on and you take the fader and you ease it up, right? And you blend it in. Well, a lot of times because by default on Pro Tools, where does the fader start? Unity. And that's great for tracking. Because that's how you should be using it at Unity most of the time for tracking. But it's not really good for mix down because it means a lot of times you just kind of jump into it. And before you know it, what happens is, is let's say I said, hey, out of all those tracks, I want you to turn something up so I can hear it better. Or, or maybe I'll just say, hey, you know what? I don't hear the bass very well out of all those tracks. What would your natural response be? Turn it up. Turn it up. How much headroom do we have, though, above zero? None, really. In reality, there is no headroom above zero. If you know much about how... The decibel works and, and, and why zero is zero, it's zero signifies above it is flipping. So with no headroom or really in reality above zero, where does that mean most of your faders on Pro Tools should really be? Yeah, they should be down. It should be less than zero being the nominal level. They should really be down. Okay, um, so that's why I have all of them set to negative infinity, because when you begin your operation, you start cycling through these, you start sampling these, you're going, okay, well, what, I'm trying to figure out what's what in this session. You really should be popping these up and bringing them in instead of just firing them on and seeing what happens. Yes, okay, uh, how far did you get? Hold on. Click it again. Okay. I'm clicking with that option. All right. And hold shift. There you go. Okay. Uh, what time do we have? 57. Oh, no way. All right, well, here's where we're going to leave off. If you guys can get your groups dialed in, dial in your groups. Go ahead and save this on your hard drive. Make sure you bring this back on Monday. We're going to be working with this on Monday, talking about edits. I want you to save this as a reminder. Chapter 2, the bullet points are due on Monday. One page bullet points due for Chapter 2. I need all these microphones, cables, and stands wrapped up so you can bring those up to the front. You want um, to save this? Say it again. You want to save this? Yeah, save that. You're going to need to bring it back Monday. Oh. It's, uh, make sure it's on your personal hard drive.